open-faced grilled cheese sandwiches, you're negating the like, oh, I didn't have bread on the first one, so I can have a second one, because you're getting double cheese. No, the cheese got all puffy. That's why it looked like lots of cheese, but it's not. No, it was just melted cheese. When Ew. cheese melts, your cheese, I think a cheese could puff, potentially, but if you just put... Yeah, like, like a cheesy. Cheesies are made of cheese, though. Yeah, they are. No, they're made... Yeah, they are. It's like puffed cheese. Like a Cheeto. Yeah. Is puffed cheese? Yeah, it like puffs up and... I don't think so. Yeah. I haven't eaten a Cheeto in many years, but I'm like 90% sure they're not made from cheese. It is. It's all cheese. I think it's pro- it's probably corn. It might I be so. like wheat or something, but I think corn's the cheapest. It's probably made of the corn. Hmm. I don't think there's anything close to real cheese in a Cheeto. No, because it's puffed up cheese. So it's like all cheese. So the inside of it, that like styrofoamy stuff, mm-hmm. that's cheese? I think so. I don't think so. Maybe someone in our listening audience can tell us, are Cheetos and cheesies made from cheese? I wager they're probably corn, but there's something like, some, there's some sort of garbage food. Okay. And you think it's real cheese. I think it's real cheese, but it's puffed up. I don't want to say like hard that you're wrong because I don't know. It's like air popped cheese. I don't think if it is, I maybe I'll start eating them because that sounds great. But I don't think that's what it is. I think it's like corn meal mixed with styrofoam sprayed orange and with some cheese flavoring. I don't think so. It's a real cheese. It's real cheese. All right. Well, we can get a sponsorship deal with Cheetos. The only cheesy made with 100% real cheese, according yep. to Samantha Hees. I'm sure we can work something together with your name and how it rhymes. 100% cheese, says Samantha Hees, oh, and yeah. you'll be on the bag. And they, if it's not, that's not false advertising. So we're not saying, we're not saying it's 100% cheese. Samantha Hees says that, which <laughs> is true. Me. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and it's her. So uh, welcome to another (laughs) episode of I Love This, You Should Too. My name is Indie Cornmeal Byproduct Rendawa, and we got (laughs) Samantha Cheese Hees. No, I hate that. Samantha Hees the Cheese. No. Samantha 100% Cheese Hees. It's better, but still not great. Samantha Cheese. No. Ham and the cheese. No. Ham and cheese. <laughs> no. Your name evolves to ham and cheese quite easily. <laughs> but anyways, this is normally a show where we talk about movies and such, and not potential cheese products, but probably not. I think I'm correct still. We could just look it up. Yeah, we could. Do you want to look it up right now so the person who's wrong could redact right now? Mm, sure. While Samantha's looking that up, I'll let you know how this is going to work. Today's one of our in-between episodes, so we're each going to have a spoiler-free review of something that's our thing of the week. And at the end of the episode, I'm going to tell Samantha what we'll be watching for our big deep dive analysis episode next week. Okay, so she's found it. What do you see, Samantha? Cornmeal is the first ingredient. And then vegetable oil. And cheese oil. is second? Oh, no, no. It's vegetable oil. And cheese is third. No. <laughs> <laughs> How long before oh, we get to cheese? This is flame and hot Cheetos, though. Oh, so the real ones are made from just cheese. Cheese is a little bit higher up on these ones. So cornmeal, um, vegetable oil, and then cheese seasoning is the third ingredient. Cheese seasoning, so not cheese. And then cheese cultures. So there is some cheese somewhere in it. And then there's also one that just listed as cheese. So it's safe to say they're not made of cheese. No, I think you're correct that they are a corn pop middle with cheese on the outside. Three kinds of cheese. No, no, no. Not <laughs> not, not three kinds of cheese. It's not like they have Gruyere, Parmesan, and cheddar. There's three cheese products. Cheese seasoning, cheese cultures. And cheese. That's not three kinds of cheese. That's different. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but you would make a great spokesperson for Cheetos because you could say three kinds of cheese. <laughs> and then you'd wink. And in the commercial, your wink would turn into an asterisk that would go on the three kinds of cheese label. Oh, yeah. May not be real cheese. No, it's real cheese. It's three kinds of real cheese. It's not. It's not. <laughs> you just read it. <laughs> it's not. Okay. Indy. Yes. What are we doing here today? 
Well, I, j- I just told everyone. Oh, I missed it. <laughs> yeah, you, you were literally two feet away from me when that happened. You know I can't, like, listen and do something on the internet at the same time. That's true. I can't listen and work. Which is troubling for me because I tend not to go on my phone when we're talking, although I'm pretty good at paying attention to both. You, on the other hand, are on your phone all the time when we're talking. <laughs> And I am coming to realize you don't hear anything I say at those I times. do, I do. <laughs> I just wasn't, I was so focused on finding out what Cheetos are made out of uh-huh. that I stopped <laughs> listening to what you were saying. Well, I, I told everyone how this is going to work, <laughs> so we can just get into it. Oh, sure. Indy, what's your thing of the week? <laughs> My thing of the week <laughs> is Star Trek Voyager. Oh, you've been watching a lot of Star Trek lately. Yeah. For whatever reason, uh month or two ago i was like i'm gonna put on the first episode of voyager i can't remember what the first episode is like and now i've watched the entire series again so you finished it yes okay yeah i tend to review things after i finished <laughs> unlike you who's 3.3 percent in outlander and you did your review on it <laughs> yep <laughs> so um i think i'm unlike most star trek people because i think if you've seen all of Star Trek, you're probably like a fan and you're for if you're a fan, you're hardcore Star Trek. I'm casual. I think it's it's all right. It's pretty good some of them. Some you're of them are quite good. Fan. But it's one of those things that people aren't casual fans of. Like you're a mm-hmm. casual hockey fan. Yeah. You know I big know players about hockey. You know I your like local team. Understand it sort of. But you're not like hardcore no. like I am and there's people way more hardcore than I. Oh yeah. Star Trek's not like that. There's not many casual people. You're either all in or you think it's dumb. Hmm. Where are you? You think it's dumb? Oh, um, I think it's dumb. Yeah. I guess if that's the lowest, I don't really care about Star Trek. <laughs> like, keep talking. <laughs> I'd love to have a Star Trek podcast where I talk about each episode. Because I think everyone who has, I'm sure there's thousands of those, oh, sure. but I think they're all like, huge Star Trek fans. And I would love to hear one from someone like me who's equally critical and coming from outside of the universe. Because yeah. people who are in the Star Trek world, they're they're a little too much. Most fandoms are. Yeah. I think Star Trek is probably one of my best fandoms for like how nice the people are. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think... Star Wars ones are a little nicer. Mm -hmm. Marvel ones now, like Marvel fans, they're a little too Mm bro-y. Although I was a huge Marvel fan as a kid. You know who my least favorite fan group is? Who? Doctor Who. Doctor Who. Oh, yeah. Doctor Who fans are so aggressive. They come out and they're like, do you love Doctor Who? And I'm like, oh, no, I've never really seen it. I've seen a couple episodes, but I don't know. They're like, well, you haven't given it a chance. Why haven't you given it a chance? You're just a snob then if you don't love it. You're saying you don't like culture if you don't like Doctor Who. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I just haven't seen it. And also, it yeah. seems really campy, most of it. Yeah. But anyways, we're not talking about Doctor Who. We're talking about Star Trek, which I've now seen every episode of Voyager. Actually, about like, I don't know, seven, eight years ago, when I was living alone in Korea and I didn't have any TV or anything, I was like, I'm going to watch all of Star Trek. I feel it's like something I should know. Mm-hmm. So I watched the original series, which is pretty much unwatchable terrible Mm -hmm. i liked next generation when it gets good deep space nine i think has the highest peak like the good deep space nine is very good oh so it's like the story is really good and engrossing yes but it doesn't have the highest average Hmm. i might like next generation best on average but anyways we're talking about voyager which i think i like I'm not a huge fan, so this isn't going to be a glowing endorsement like usually I do on these, but I I just need to talk about Voyager. I'd love to talk about every episode, and I'd have that podcast where I just talk about, like, this doesn't make sense. Why don't people realize that the Star Trek universe is inherently flawed in so many ways? Yeah. I'd love to talk about it. But nobody I know cares about Star Trek, and then the people who do, I don't want to engage with them. No, they're they're too too much. much. Yeah, too much. (laughs) You just want to, like, casually engage with people about it. So, like, Star Trek is known for its very lofty ideas, but then the show is still very light. It's not terribly serious. And that's, like, a nice change because every show now, unless it's a comedy, is very serious. There's Mm -hmm. no lightness to them. And I think that's even present in the new Star Trek shows because they are very serious and they feel less like Star Trek because of that. Neither better nor worse, but they feel less like 
like Voyager and Next Generation, they're straight up silly episodes all the time. And even when it's like life and death, it doesn't feel that dramatic. Mm -hmm. Everything's light and fanciful, I guess. Like I showed you one episode once where I was like, hey, come watch this. This uh, captain's falling in love with a Scottish hologram. And you're like, yeah, this seems like my kind of thing. Yeah, it was like Outlander, but space. (laughs) Yeah. And Voyager in specific is hated by a lot of Star Trek fans. But I've learned that if there's one thing that Star Trek fans hate, it's Star Trek. (laughs) Like the reaction to Discovery was... Is that the one that has like a multi diverse like multi-ethnic diverse cast yes but the other ones did as well not not to this extent right but they like picked yes more than but there's just asian people two women in charge <gasps> and that is that How is too dare much dare they <laughs> women belong in the star kitchen <laughs> <laughs> that's my new favorite quote <laughs> Please note that I don't actually think women belong in the star kitchen. They should be in the hollow deck where women belong. Is that a thing? Did I? Yeah, that might be a more controversial take. Actually. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I don't know what the hollow deck is. This is <laughs> going to be the longest review of Voyager before I even talk about Voyager. <laughs> but it's another situation like um, Ghostbusters, the new one with a female cast. Where this was hated for a reason, and I agree with the end point, but Mm -hmm. I don't like their reasoning behind it. Mm Because so many people are like, female Ghostbusters, this is PC culture run amok, this is the worst, they're taking everything, it's us men are persecuted, which is like the most ridiculous thing ever. The opposite of what's happening, yeah. But then other people are like, this is great, this is a great step for women, and I love this movie, which is also not true, and it's just not a good movie. Not because of the women, but because of the (laughs) script. So lost in all of that is the fact that that Ghostbusters movie just wasn't very good. Mm -hmm. And I feel like Voyager might be kind of in there. That people hate it, but they hate it. I think one of the big reasons is, is that there was a woman captain. Because when you get into any talk about which Star Trek series people like, the first conversation is like, oh, who's the best captain? Is it Kirk or Picard? And I hate Kirk because I think that show was bad and none of his decisions make sense and I think he's a bad actor. Mm -hmm. But Janeway, people either love because they're like, yeah, she's a strong woman who's doing willing to do whatever. Or they're like, no, I hate her. Why do women have to be in charge of everything? And both of those arguments aren't great because she's just not that good, not having anything to do with being a woman. (laughs) I feel like after seeing like three different 30 second clips, I would walk into the room and be like, oh, what's she screwing up today? (laughs) (laughs) It's like the sad reality of just writing women Mm -hmm. in media. Like people are going to hate them without any just cause. I dislike her with what I think is very just cause. Okay. She was written in a way which I think is a reaction to these type of people because they're going to be so critical of any female captain that they made her great at everything. Oh, so she doesn't like have a focus. So like once there's somebody that is dying in their sick bay, the doctor's right there, and she jumps on and starts performing CPR when they literally have like a spray that brings people back to life. But she jumps on and is like giving people CPR. That's dumb. And then they have to like rescue people from a big jail. Do they send their giant security team? No, they send the captain. She slides down a chute and starts like kicking people and shooting people. Why would you send the captain in for that? Yeah, that makes no sense. The captain actually has like things to do generally. And that's why I like the Picard ones because he delegates stuff. He doesn't go kick ass. He knows that's not what his job is. And then when there's, like, engineering problems, she's the one that has the solution, not the people who went to school for engineering. She's just the best at everything, which got annoying. Oh, yeah, I could see how that would get really annoying to watch. Because it's like, oh, you have that talent, too? Yeah. But there's an entire trained workforce for that. This is a a terrible review. The premise of the show, uh, there's a ship. It's called Voyager. It gets launched across space by... Magic, essentially, we'll say, because that's a whole explanation. (laughs) And then the whole show is them just trying to get back. From space. Back home to, like, space that they know, because they're so, so far away. Oh, so they're, like, lost in space. Yeah, like, much like that show. Lost in space? Voyager. (laughs) Lost in space. 
Voyager. <laughs> is the show called Voyager Lost in Space? No. <laughs> Why am I so dumb today? You're not. <laughs> Lost in Space on? was a was a long running TV show. Okay. It has nothing to do with Star Trek. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So Voyager. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> um Another thing I don't like about the show is that they don't play by their own rules a lot. They set up very specific rules, like the Prime Directive, which all the Star Trek people know. But for the rest of us, they have a rule that if you encounter some alien culture, you're not allowed to interfere because you may change their course of evolution or change their history. Because if we saw some like space people here, that would change how we think about things, right? right. So they're like that all the time but then in one episode they're just like hey want to go change time for these people and they're like yeah okay when it suits her she does it the captain but then when one of her crewmates wants to just like make out with an alien she's like no you're forbidden from that we could change their culture meanwhile she's literally going back in time constantly (laughs) so like i you're kind of forgiving because it's like a long-running series but If you set up specific rules, you have to play by your specific rules. Or at least address that you're breaking that rule. Mm -hmm. Or else it's just lazy writing. And there was an interesting change kind of halfway through the series. There was a very annoying character, and uh, she was taken out, and a new one was brought in. And this gave the show a big boost because it was doing terribly in the ratings. I think this is in the late 90s now is when this is happening. And you'd think everyone would love this because now the show's doing better. It's getting renewed for more seasons. But apparently, like, the cast members hated this new cast member mm-hmm. because she was brought in. And because of how she was brought in, they just made her, like, all sexed up. And it was clearly oh. done to appeal to teenage nerd boys. Which one is she? Her name is Seven of Nine. And I gave you the explanation of her, which is very intriguing. And that's what complicates this more is that this character was brought in for sex appeal turns out very complex and introduces very interesting story things as well so you're like "Uh, i kind of hate it because why is she wearing tights when everyone else is the same uniform that's weird oh is she the one who's always like in a unitard yeah okay yeah yeah why is she wearing yeah i wondered that when i saw her one time i'm like i can see her full butt yeah and it's clearly done just for that yeah but the thing is she becomes the most compelling character as well So you're like, I hate that they're doing this, but it also is working. Mm Because I told you about there's this uh, species, which if you don't know Star Trek at all, this might actually sound interesting to you. If you know (laughs) Star Trek, you're like, yeah, and you don't explain it to me like I'm dumb. But there's a whole species. I'm dumb today. (laughs) (laughs) I'm Star Trek dumb. Yeah. There's this whole species, and they're called the Borg. And all they do is conquer other civilizations, but they don't kill the people. They turn them into them. Because they're like part robotic. So they're completely unfeeling. They You can't reason with them. People surrender and say, we'll do this. Just don't kill us. And they go, no, we don't do that. We don't negotiate. They don't talk. They just go in and turn you into them. And then they have this giant collective with one individual mind, essentially. And then they manage to break someone out of this. And she's dealing with being a individual for the first time in her life. Oh, that's so, interesting. Yeah, lots of interesting philosophical stuff comes out of it. They don't always address it in the best place, but it it comes up. But then you're also like, why does she have to show her boobs all the time? Just give her the uniform that everyone else has. Yeah. And they try to say like, oh, it's for her health she does this. You can put something on top of it. Yeah. Just saying. Give her a little smock. <laughs> yeah, just give her a little smock. <laughs> a nice top to go with her leggings. And the show does touch on very interesting very lofty, very compelling ideas a lot. But it doesn't deal with it in the best way all the time. Like they talk about the nature of humanity and at which point artificial life deserves the same rights as humans. Mm. But it's not like Blade Runner. They have this hologram doctor who's just like an asshole all the time and brings it up. So they deal with it, but not as delicately as other things do. There's an episode where... They discover a less advanced civilization, Mm -hmm. and then other alien species do as well. And those others are going to come in there essentially as missionaries. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, we're going to save them. We're going to show them all these things. And then the Star Trek crew is like, well, should we allow this? And they're kind of likening missionary work to an invasion, because Mm -hmm. that is essentially what missionary work is. is. And that's a super interesting concept. Do they really tackle it? Not really. A little Mm. bit, though. 
once they go to a planet and they're orbiting it, but time passes differently on the planet. So the people on the planet see this spaceship for thousands of years so they worship it as a god at first and then they get the technology to come up there Ah. and meet them and they're like so are you gods what's going on and that's such an interesting thing too yeah i like that storyline there's so many really interesting things there's also a lot of garbage (laughs) there's a lot of really stupid things that don't make any sense But again, I want a whole podcast to talk about each episode of Voyager Mm -hmm. to complain and praise. Overall, I think what shows like this need more is fans who are not diehard Star Trek fans. Mm -hmm. Give it a shot. Go watch it. Because I feel like people like, like you or like me before I went through all of it, if you're not into Star Trek and have some sort of basis, you're not going to just... I'm going to watch a Star Trek series today, right? Yeah, no, it seems like a lot to take on. It absolutely does. So I'd say to you non-Star Trek fans, go out, give it a shot. Maybe you'll like some of it. Maybe you want to start with Next Generation. I think Deep Space Nine and Voyager have their moments as well. And for you Star Trek fans, you're probably like, Voyager's the worst one of all. Give it a shot. I don't think it is. I would argue there are many worse ones. Well, a few worse ones. <laughs> I think it was definitely a product of its time. And at the time it was hated. And I think people just kind of got into it like, oh, yeah, this is the bad one. And it was just kind of accepted. But oh. you didn't really look at some of the stuff. Because in later seasons, I think there's some really interesting stuff going on there. Like Outlander in space. Like Outlander in space. Actually, that was one of the things I think is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> It was a joke, Marge. She, she meets this holographic bartender who has a wife, and then she's like, delete the wife. And she <laughs> deletes the wife character so she can go make out with this bartender. Yep. Uh, classic Janeway. Breaking the rules when it suits you. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Star Trek Voyager, it's out on uh, Netflix, at least here in Canada, as are the other ones. I think I might just go keep going and watch Deep Space Nine again. Because good Deep Space Nine, when it gets into the war and stuff, ooh, it was quite good. Oh, okay. Well, I know you'll be having more wedding planning space dreams. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That took way too long and I actually said very little about the show. So now, Samantha, for a much better job of doing a quick review of oh a TV show, what's your thing of the week? This is a lot of pressure, <laughs> but this week I am super into the TV show Catfish. May may I interject into your bit a bit? Because I did a bad job at mine, so yeah. I want to save it with yours. So we watch a TV show called 90 Day Fiancé, which is admittedly bad, and we know it, but that is our one, like, bad junk show Guilty that we pleasure. love. Guilty pleasure, yeah. Years ago, I had seen a few episodes of this show, Catfish, which Samantha will soon tell you the premise of, and I thought, like... I see what you like about 90 Day Fiancé. I feel like you would like this as well. So I got a few episodes and I showed them to you. How did you like it? Um, I liked it so much more than I thought I was going to. She was enthralled. So, so much so. I thought you were angry at me because you never are like that (laughs) into a TV show. When I pick a movie that I think like this is the most amazing movie, you're like, whatever, checking your phone, chatting. But this show, you were just so locked in that I thought you were like angry and you're like, what? Huh? Oh, no, no, I'm not angry. Just, you know. Catfish, catfish. <laughs> so what's the premise of this show? Um, so there's two guys who um, go travel around the country. The first season that we watched was quarantine time. So they couldn't travel. So it was all kind of webcam based. But um, we've watched some earlier episodes now. And so they travel around the country helping people who write in um, who want their internet friend or internet girlfriend um, or boyfriend kind of like they want clarification on who they are and where they live and if they're actually that person. What is a catfish? A catfish is somebody on the internet who is pretending to be someone else. Yeah and each episode has a different person who says I've been talking to this person often for years. Mm -hmm. Something's not adding up here. And then they come in and do the investigation. And to very surprising results. Mm -hmm. I assume the show would go the same way every week. 
where it would be, hey, I've been talking to this beautiful girl online, but she'll never meet me. Oh, it turns out it's a creepy old dude that lives in the mom's basement. Yeah. And it just repeat over and over. Yeah. Again. But that hasn't been the case. No, um, they do a really good job of kind of like mixing up the outcome. So it's not always like, oh, this person was completely different. Sometimes it's um, like an episode we watched. It was this rapper who lived in a completely different state from this girl. And she was like, I think it's him, but he never wants to video chat me. And so we never met and we've never like talked. And he's like a, a small time celebrity at yeah. least. Who, so he's well known, has thousands of followers. Yeah. But they're not talking through any of their normal accounts. So you're like, oh, that's clearly not him then. Because he's not using his own Instagram or yes. whatever. So it's like she goes down there with the host of the show. And they realize it's just because they're like awkward teenagers. Yeah. And it was. And it she was really just, was having a conversation yeah. with this rapper. And he likes her. Yeah. The end. The end. <laughs> and it was shocking. It was shocking. Um not as shocking as that 90 day fiance reveal when the woman we thought was a catfish was actually real yeah but that's happened in this one as well where there was a guy who only has one picture of this younger man who's supposedly so into him and one picture no phone calls no video chat clearly that's not the real person no it was it was the real person he just doesn't like sending pictures also the most awful person on that show yeah or there was one where this guy's looking for his, who he considers his boyfriend of two years, even mm-hmm. though they've never met. And he takes along his best friend, who's also his cousin, and they're looking and they can't find it where this person actually lives. And while they're out there looking, the best friend cousin goes, yeah, that was me. You called me fat once. So I've been fucking you over for three years, yeah. carrying on this fake identity changing my voice on the phone just to mess with you yeah that was nuts yeah and it was like three quarters of the way through the episode too like she'd been helping him and like that was crazy um because she was so nonchalant about it and you could tell that she was just like a pathological liar we do get quite a few or sociopath who just like has no emotional connection to the fact that they're like ruining somebody's life anyway you should watch it if you want something um that you can kind of get a story in one sitting it's one thing i like about it is it you're on to the next one after the episode i think our normal listeners will know the types of things Mm -hmm. i like so you might not think that i'd be all over this catfish show it's surprisingly good. It really is. Because there is such variety. There are legitimate surprises. And it is a mystery that you kind of get wrapped up in. Mm-hmm. It seems silly because you might think like, oh, it's just a bunch of like teenagers chatting on Facebook. How interesting can that be? It somehow is. They it's do a, extremely a interesting. pretty solid job for a MTV show about catfishes <laughs> to have a lot of variety to have a decent pace to it and to make it feel like you are watching a mystery show on each episode. It's equal parts reality show where you kind of watch it for the sake of like, oh, look at these crazy lives, which is a part of reality Mm -hmm. TV, I think. But that is balanced nicely with having it be an actual mystery that we get some resolution to, which is hard to do in a short show very true yeah so you got the full thing it's really great i love that we can just like sit down and watch like an hour of it and feel like it's a good place to stop i know a lot of our uh, like 90 day fiance or one of the other shows married at first sight that we're watching oh we just got into that i don't think i can uh i don't think i'm gonna make it no we'll finish it Uh, you're a completionist you have that's true yeah that's true Um, But yeah, so those ones are like an hour and a half per episode or two and a half hours, depending on like what version you're watching. And it's just like, there's never a good place to stop. And like, it's how you end up watching like nine hours of television in one day. (laughs) It is uh, weird that I can say like, hey, let's watch this movie. And you'll be like, oh, it's like two hours long. Let's not. Let's watch eight episodes of this TV (laughs) show instead. Yeah. And we're like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's a better use of our time. Yeah. <laughs> Even though we have a movie podcast. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, so that's that's my thing of the week. Um, I don't want to give too much away because, like, it's really easy to start telling secrets of episodes and stuff. But I think everyone should give it a try. It's worth a watch, especially if you like any little inklings of reality TV. Because mm-hmm. I think it is the better end of that whole uh 
subgenre. Yeah, there's no one just being shitty to be shitty. Like, it's not... Like, you see people on reality shows who are like, oh, I'm going to really play up my attitude or, like, how bad I am. And then you end up just, like, hating them because they're, like, clearly doing this just to antagonize the other person. Whereas this, it's, like, people with big personalities, but a lot of the time they don't even, like, care or realize how bad they're being. Yeah. So it's a lot more real. And it might be a generational thing, but so many of the people are willing to then talk about the terrible things they've done on the show. Yeah. Which I thought if you got caught doing something terrible, you would just run away. But these people... I would run away. I don't think I'd ever catfish anyone, but I would definitely run away if I got caught. Have you ever catfished someone? No, I just said I didn't. Have you ever been catfished? No. Well... I am actually a 14-year-old Korean girl. My name is Minji, and this has all been an act. What? Gotcha, sucker. We live together. How are you a 14-year-old <laughs> That's how girl? good I am. Oh. We talk about this a lot because we also listen to like some true crime podcasts and yeah. things. And the most shocking thing about people who live double lives isn't the... Uh, Well, it might be the murder that often comes at the end. But second to that is how they have the time for multiple families. Yes. I don't understand people who have multiple families. I have just you, my own, like my parents and siblings and that. And I'm laid off right now. I feel like I don't have enough time for things. (laughs) No. Let alone having multiple wives and children. That's fucking nuts. So Indy, the reason we're here, and I know you explain this to everybody, but... What are we going to be watching this week? So we are coming up on 100 episodes. Oh. We're almost there. Oh my goodness. That's crazy. And one of the craziest things to me is that we're that far in and perhaps my two favorite living directors haven't been represented yet. On our podcast? Yeah. What? Those being Martin Scorsese Mm -hmm. and Wong Kar Wai. Mm -hmm. So Wong Kar Wai, I keep wanting to do Chungking Express. Or any of his, really, because I just, I love the guy. Mm -hmm. But I keep saying I'm going to wait because there's a big Blu-ray release of a box set of much of his work. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to wait till that comes out so people could uh, find it more easily. And plus, I really want to buy that, too. So probably like April, May? It may be before our 100th episode. Okay. So that leaves me with uh, Martin Scorsese. Okay. I like Martin Scorsese. Oh, what do you know of him? Movies. Can you tell me a Martin Scorsese movie you've seen? I can't think of one off the top of my head. Okay. Well, two of his best movies, in my opinion. Well, actually, my favorite movie of all time, probably, is a Martin Scorsese movie called Taxi Driver. Okay. Starring Robert De Niro. We're not doing that because I'm just not ready. Like... I would need a good month to prepare for our taxi driver. <laughs> you episode. talk about taxi driver quite often on the podcast. I think because we had talked about Joker on this and Joker is just right. taxi yes. driver yeah. mixed with King of Comedy. King of Comedy, which I watched yesterday, holds up. It's better than your, I remember. Really? So there's a little sleeper pick. Go watch King of Comedy. It's on <laughs> Amazon Prime right now. Oh, okay. Um, Goodfellas will do on this at some point. I think it's one of the best films of the 90s. Is it's- Scarface uh- no, that's Brian De Palma. Oh, okay. That's from around like 83, starring Al Pacino. Okay. Scarface. Oh, man. I just want to talk about Scarface now. <laughs> Scarface, you come around three times on it. So you see it the first time. You're like, whoa, this is crazy. And that's when I was like 16. Mm-hmm. So you're like, oh, cool. Bullets, drugs. I like it. And then I was like 20 and watched it again. I was like, oh, this is just all over the top and silliness. It's not as good as I remember. <laughs> I've grown up now. Then I watched it when I was like 26 and like had some film theory under my mm-hmm. belt. And I was like, oh, the excess of the direction and the action is directly proportional to the excess of this character through his uh, like overhyped masculinity and drug use and everything. This is very intentional and brilliant. So you get to watch Scarface <laughs> throughout your life to really uh, appreciate so you it. You come around on it. Yeah. You come around to a different opinion. What are we talking about again? Uh, Your pick of the week, which is Scorsese. Oh, right. Not Scarface, not De Palma. No. Um, So I went with Raging Bull. Okay. From 1980. This is maybe the best sports movie I've ever seen. Oh, it's a sports movie. It's maybe the best biopic I've ever seen. Oh, okay. 
It chronicles the life of a real life boxer, Jake LaMotta, Mm -hmm. and it's taken from his biography. Mm -hmm. It stars Robert De Niro in, I think, his best performance. I know I like Taxi Driver better and like Goodfellas is crazy good. And he does so many other things that are not as well recognized. But I think his straight up best performance and maybe one of the best performances I've seen in cinema is him in Raging Bull. Okay. I'm excited to watch it then. It also stars Kathy Moriarty, Joe Pesci. And when it came out, it had very moderate box office success. It, I think it made its money back, but not much more than that. It had mixed reviews, but it was still nominated for eight Academy Awards. And it won two for editing and actor. In, oh, uh, okay. De Niro. And I think those are two things we should watch out for, or everyone out there should watch out for. The style of editing was very unique at the time. And I wish I remember the editor's name, but it was a woman who won the Oscar for this and worked with Scorsese a lot. And there weren't a lot of women working in the technical fields of film at the time. So she's a, a real pioneer. We'll get that to you for the next episode. Excellent. And in 1990, it became the first film to be selected for preservation by the National Film Registry. And nowadays, I think it's regarded as one of the best films of all time, not just by me, but by critics all over. So it's something that really gained over the years. And we haven't watched it yet? No, I haven't done any Scorsese. That's crazy. Because I often pick things that I think you will love. Mm. Things that I love, but it's like, oh, Sam's going to love this. Because when we watch like A League of Their Own, I knew you were going to love it. <laughs> I knew I do love it. I think it's a great movie. Yeah. But Raging Bull, I'm not sure you will. I fear after you'll watch it, you'll be like, that's a very good movie. I understand why people think it's great. I never need to see it again. <laughs> I th- think that's where it might go okay and honestly that's not the worst because you we can still have a big conversation about Mm -hmm. it but a lot of the movies i think are the best movies are not movies i like to rewatch. right in fact i watched raging bull probably when i was about 19 and i was watching every scorsese movie Mm -hmm. i don't think i've seen it since oh But it's still in my mind, it's one of the best movies ever made. That's surprising. So, but those movies I don't watch a lot. Like I've seen Beauty and the Beast and A League of Their Own like 30 times each. I've seen Taxi Driver three times. I've seen Godfather three times maybe. Hmm. I have a pretty good memory for film. And those types of movies, I don't feel like I need to rewatch often. There's some some movies, yeah, that you just don't need to watch every day. Yeah, I think your most rewatched movies are not the best movies because mm-hmm. the best movie I need to sit down and like just watch that movie. Right. While rewatchable movies like Harold and Kumar I can watch several times. <laughs> no big deal. But let's watch a trailer for okay. Raging Bull. The Bronx Bull, the Raging Bull. Let's hear for the great Jake LaMotta, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I'm the best. I can take him more than anybody. You're dead. You're married. Leave the young girls for me. There's no way I'm going down. I don't go down for nobody. Let me sit with him. Why does he have to make it so hard on himself? If you beat Sugar Ray, you'll get a shot at the title. You feel that way? There's no one else around who wants to fight me. They're all afraid. There's a lot of bad things, Joey. Maybe it's coming back to me. Damn, that's a beautiful trailer. <laughs> I think I'll cut it for you folks because uh, most like no of talking. it is just music with shots from the movie. And I, oh, I'm so excited to watch it again. <laughs> it looks, it looks gorgeous. What do you think of this? I'm having a hard time getting a read on it. It seems like a sports movie, um, but it also seems like it has a lot more going on. Yeah, and when I say sports movie, I mean it does focus on his boxing a lot. Mm-hmm. But it's not a movie about boxing. Right. It's not about his career as much as it is about his life. And of course, his career is a big part of that. But just as big as his relationships with other people are. So mm-hmm. just as a biopic of you would feature your work life prominently, that's the same for this. But right. I don't think it's a boxing movie, maybe. Okay. It looks very... There's lots of facets. 
And uh, yeah, I'm excited. And if you're watching it and you see parts where it looks like De Niro has like not great makeup on to make him look much bigger than he is, Mm -hmm. it's not makeup. He just gained like 60 pounds during this movie. And nowadays we see that more often and it's kind of maybe unnecessarily heralded as a sign of a great actor mm-hmm. like when joaquin like phoenix method loses all that weight to be joker so you're like oh he's he must be really good he got so skinny yeah and this was kind of at least in my life of course this was made before i was born but i think this is one of those first instances and for the longest time i think until christian bale's jump from the machinist to batman i think this was like the greatest weight gain in for a portrayal oh so I think he went from 145 to 215 in a few months. Oh. And I love the story of how he did this. He just went on a tour of France and Italy and just ate <laughs> and everything. then came back to shoot the rest of ate it. Ate and drank everything. Yeah. But we'll talk about all of that later. He also got into such good shape that his trainer said, like, if you want, you can quit acting, be a professional boxer. Like, he Really? Like, they thought he could. He wow. Could, like, yeah. That's impressive. But we'll save all of that for next week. Okay. Uh, one little warning is it is a violent movie. Okay. Of course, there's the boxing. It goes a little further than that, too. Not into any of our horror movies, because those are violent. And yeah. it's not near what's in, like, uh, Game of Thrones. Mm, okay. But when you have a very realist movie and you have a man hitting his wife, it can be more disturbing right. than those types of things in uh, Game of Thrones. So that happens in this. And it's not a movie where it's trying to show you, like, look at this great life. Because I think we have that association with biopics, that it's a hero story. That's not what you're going to get here, so don't expect it. If you're like, this isn't a good movie, I hate this character. That's fine. Mm -hmm. This is one of those takes where it's just showing you this is what happened, and then you take what you want from it. And I think it's just beautifully, beautifully done. Mm -hmm. And I think that this movie does one of the greatest things a biopic could ever do, because we'll talk about it more next week. This movie came out during Jake LaMotta's life. Mm -hmm. He saw it and reflected on his own life and learned about himself based on what he saw in the movie oh which is a pretty amazing thing if you can teach the the person person you're about about themselves and make them realize things well we can get into a little bit like he said to his wife after watching it was i that bad and she was like yeah you were you were worse and he like understood for the first time after seeing de niro be him that's amazing yeah that's amazing. So we'll talk about all of that. It's, um, I think, just over two hours. It should be pretty easy to find because it is a big movie. It's not on many streaming services right now. But if you are working with your public library, you can find it on the Hoopla system, mm, which okay. all of us in Edmonton have access to if you have an EPL card. Mm-hmm. Also, there's that handy little Google Drive that's a mystery. We don't know who made it. just showed up one day. But if you message us on any one of our services, we'll send you the link that has a folder of our most recent and upcoming movies that you can uh, watch for free. Awesome. But we don't know where it came from. Well, I'm excited to watch this movie. I think it'll be very different from some of the other movies that you've brought me. And uh, I am cautiously interested. Cautiously interested. Samantha, cautiously interested, he is. <laughs> Me. I'm Indy, enthusiastically chatting Randella. <laughs> and you can see us both next week here as we talk about Raging Bull. Yes, maybe I will be enthusiastically chatting next week. Oh, I know I will be. (laughs) Okay, we'll see you next week. Bye, everyone.